Welcome to 2022, people. Welcome to the very first video of this year. We are going to start off very strong with a top 10 list and finishing up videos that should have been done since last year. That's how we do it. It's about time I finally get to tell you about my favorite games in 2021. So, number 10, Viticulture. <laughs> Now this game is all about making wine. You're gonna do so by having different workers, allocating them in different areas. It's a super strong worker placement game and you're going to be building up resources either through different buildings which give you unique structure powers. You also have different phases of the game from spring, summer, winter, fall. Every phase you're doing something different but ultimately this is a very, very, at its core, a very strong worker placement game. Now, I'll be honest with you, I never wanted to Played this game initially because of the theme by itself. I don't drink and you know it being a wine making game it just didn't appeal to me at first. On top of that this game has been out for eight years. That's a long time. Despite it being out so long ago it was my first time playing it in 2021 and this is why it made it onto my top 10 list because of player choices. Out of all the games on today's list this game has like the most amount of player choices. And for me, I love that because it's always a good feeling when you're playing a game and it makes you want to play it again and approach it differently. Viticulture, let me tell you now, has so many player choices that are incredibly, incredibly fun and satisfying to make. It 100% hurts my brain, both playing it and also thinking about how it was designed and how all the actions up front affects everything downstream. Let me give you a specific example. Let's say you're in summer. You have a choice to gain money, which you can use to buy all your buildings, to pay for card actions, to upgrade your sellers. This is just to name a few. And then you can draw a vine card, which then affects the types of grapes that you gain, how you'll plan your crops in the future, and whether or not you want to search for other types of grapes. You can play a visitor card to give you unique actions. You can sell your grapes or buy or sell your fields to prioritize which crops that you want. And you can also plant the vine cards that you have. In one phase, you have six actions. And out of all those six actions, they will all lead you down a completely different and unique path. That is why it is so incredibly fun. I love this game. However, if you don't like player choices, if you don't like games that will probably take a lot longer on your turn because you have so many things to consider, if you don't like a game that will probably invite you to reach paralysis, analysis paralysis, then this may not be the best fit for you. But for me, I love this game because of how many options that you have throughout the entire game and how every single choice that you make will definitely affect how you approach the game downstream. It's really fun despite everything about this game, honestly, just from like the cover. Um, the art isn't really my style of games. The theme is nowhere near something I would pick, but it's one very, very good example of how not to judge a book by its cover. If you like worker placement and you haven't tried out Viticulture for the past eight years like me, then you definitely need to try out this game because the worker placement is just so incredibly satisfying. Now, you know what I thought what would be fun and would be really cool to incorporate into these future top X lists is reasons why I rank board games higher than the previous ones. So going to number nine, the reason why this one made it a step further than Viticulture is because, because, because of the player interaction. Now, quick premise, because I know this might come up in the comments, but know that these games on my list, they're like comparing apples to oranges, but ultimately it comes down to which one I would rather play if I had a choice between two, even, like when you see the list as it progresses on, two completely different genres of games. But this one, the reason why I'm ranking higher than Viticulture is because of the player interactions. is a remake of an older game of Kemet, and this is the revised edition. I'm gonna summarize this game for you in a few words. Armies, epic combat, Egyptian gods. What more can you want in the game? Now in Kemet, you are raising an army, you're building up pyramids, you're fighting across Egypt. Honestly, what more can you want? I can answer that. I can answer my own, my own question. Combat. With games like this, of this scale, where there are a bunch of miniatures or just a full-on combat-oriented game, the one thing that really scares you or makes you hesitant about playing it is combat. You have these crazy epic scaled armies and the last thing that would be so lackluster, the most disappointing thing is to have combat that sucks. I'm so happy that in Kemet that is not the case. You see all these games and you're just like, I just want some tasty combat mechanics and then sometimes they fall flat, right? It's like, okay, well combat was just 
that's it. You, you draw a card and roll one die and then whoever has a higher number wins. Like it just, it rips a heart out when a combat oriented game doesn't deliver on combat. Obviously with Kemet being on my top 10 list, it definitely delivers. Here's why Kemet's battle system is so good. So for battle, you're gonna secretly pick out these battle cards that list your attack damage, your block damage, and also your blood damage, or in turn, it could also be unblockable blood damage. So all players are gonna start off with the same battle cards. So you actually pick two that you have, you discard one and then you play the other so that way there's some mystery in which card that you play because eventually you'll actually be able to guess what the other person is playing since we all have the same battle cards to start with. But then you can also add divine intervention cards which give you bonuses as well. And then once you reveal your battle cards, you add up different bonuses from the city that you're battling in, the number of units that you have, different player powers, creatures, and the player with the highest strength will win. But even if you win, I love that both sides will suffer casualties. I also love the choices for the winner. They can actually choose to recall the creeps if they want to, but the loser from that battle will actually have to retreat from that area. And Battle on Kemet is just so juicy. I don't know what else to call it. It's just so good and it's so fun. And on top of that, there's no dice involved at all, which makes it even that much more interesting. For me, this is the highlight of Kemet. It's the, the theme, the production quality, all that matches epic combat oriented gameplay. I played this at the five player count and it's been amazing. You have everyone just building up their armies, teleporting around different parts of the map, moving, traversing. It has so much play interaction and I love the different phases between the night phase and the day phase where in the day we're moving and we're battling, but then at night we're like recuperating and gaining all our resources back. Now aside from battle, I love how you have access to different actions for day and night because because in the day, like I mentioned earlier, you're powering up and you're positioning your troops. And at night, you all come together, you figure out how many resources everyone gains from temple control. There's just a good balance between combat and rest and recovery. I just, I love everything about this game. Bottom line, even if it is a combat oriented game, there are just a ton of things going on and it's not convoluted. The gameplay flows super well. And that is the reason why Kemet is number nine on my top 10 list. Honestly, I feel like it's going to move up higher once I get more plays into it. I've only had like two or three plays of it, but from that preliminary review of it, it's just, it's really fun. Okay, so are you enjoying this top 10 list so far? These two games are just, I feel like they're highly coveted games. So if you feel the same way or you feel differently about Kemet and Viticulture, let me know down in the comments below. And also, you know what I found out the other day? This one hit, this one hit my heart, man, when I realized this statistic. 90% of you are not subscribed to this channel and we are trying to grow as big as possible in 2022. So if you wanna help me out here, just click that little button on the side. If you like Cinematics, if you like what I do here, it takes a couple of seconds to just support me. And yeah, let's all, let's all grow together. Okay, so with number eight that I'm holding my hand right now, before you click away from this video, as soon as I mentioned what it is, know that I thought very long and hard about this list and the past two games, I didn't play as much as all the others that are gonna be here. Number eight, hear me out on it. I know it's gonna come out of freaking left field for now, but just hear me out when I tell you that number eight is Tapu. Tapu is a party game that I actually found off of Reina's TikTok. I'm gonna explain this game to you in like 10 seconds. All you have to do is take one of these cards in, that's provided in the back of the game, and then you pick one of the categories shown in one of the colors. So for example, for this one, I'll pick vegetables. And then for that round, all you have to do is say a word with one of the first letters beginning with that word that matches with vegetables. For example, I can say celery. There you go, and then click C. And of course, there's a timer, which you can just go around the table. And if you can't come up with a word in the amount of time provided, then you lose for that round. That's pretty much it, that's Tapple. Here's why Tapple is number eight on my list. With every single board game night, my group always asks me to finish off with Tapple. So we essentially play this every single time we get together because they just love this game. We have so many inside jokes from playing this game. I love it because it's just so inviting for everybody and there's no designated player count. You can play with as many people as you want. You can get into teams, you can have multiple teams, you can have almost all ages play and it's just so fun. It's just so easy to grab from your shelf and play. You don't need a rule book, you know exactly how to play it. There is no setup, you put it on the table and you start playing. And that's why I love this game so much. So be gentle with me in the comments. I know I ranked it higher than Kemet, but honestly, like I said earlier, if I played Kemet more often, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be higher on my list. But I thought long and hard about it, thought about all of our gameplay experiences and Tapple really just, yeah. That's all I gotta say about it. Okay, time to get a little more serious again and tell you about my number seven on this list. Surprise. Hands down, this is the most unique game that I've ever played across all time. 
Merchant's Cove is so beautifully designed. In here, you're a merchant who is operating their own shop and you have an entire agenda of things to do before people come in and you start selling their goods to them across different markets. Every character is very, very unique, but ultimately, you'll move your character, you generate an action that's specific to you, and then your goal is to produce goods. Here's why Merchant's Cove is just so, so good. Usually with games, they kind of focus around one or two, maybe three, board game mechanics, worker placement, card drafting, dice, what have you. With Merchant's Co, it's like the jack of all trades, but it does everything and executes it exceptionally well. I was scared first that this game actually stretches itself too thin with how many different board game mechanics is inside all this, but I'm so glad that it plays incredibly well. Not only do you really, really feel like you're forging weapons and brewing potions and training dragons, but you're doing so many unique actions and these all get tied together every phase when everyone's trying to sell different items to the merchants that are coming in. Merchants Cove is on my top 10 list because I feel like it gives you that individuality. It gives you the freedom to kind of just play around with your own little mini game, but at the same time, it brings all the players together every single phase. So there's still that play interaction there, but it still gives you your unique character feel. I 100% want to do a full review on Merchant's Cove, but that is number seven. Now moving on to number six. Now typically, if there's a problem with this channel, and that is I typically don't cover co-ops because I usually don't like co-ops, but there are a few games moving up on this list that are co-ops and that have made it because they are just that good when playing solo. Here's one of them. Number six might have also been one of the top cinematics that I really enjoyed doing in 2021, and that is the pandemic system integrated with World of Warcraft. That is a mouthful to say. But this game honestly is just so incredibly fun. I've only played it solo, but let me tell you now, if you're a fan of the Blizzard IP, if you like the characters from Blizzard, from World of Warcraft, you are going to love this game. I feel like it's one of the best iterations of a Blizzard IP in board game form. I feel like the pandemic system is so beautifully integrated with World of Warcraft and also the expansion that they chose with it being Wrath of the Lich King. It's just so beautifully done because you have a ton of team synchronicity. That's a fun word too, synchronicity. There's a ton of team synchronicity so you can play around with different characters. They all have um, asymmetric powers. And then your goal ultimately in this game is to control these heroes, complete quests, and then eventually face the wrath of the Lich King. You're fighting abominations, you're fighting ghouls, you're really trying to balance when to complete quests, when to take damage for quests, and when to also make sure that you don't accumulate too many ghouls and minions and all the other enemies uh, that's gonna cause you to lose the game. So it's a really beautiful balance that you're trying to play throughout the entire game from questing to making sure your enemies are depleted and to also reach your end goal, which is to face the Lich King. And I think it's so cool also how the Ice Crown Citadel flips on the other side in order for you to face him as well. That's just so, it's so satisfying. The reason why this is ranked number six on my list, the reason why it's inching up a little bit further than all the other games is because of the tension. The build of this game, the tension is the reason why I wanna just take it off my shelf and play. It's just so fun and I really love approaching this game multiple different ways. Eventually, I hope there are expansions to this. I hope more characters are involved and I hope the campaign system evolves a little bit more. But other than that, great game, really fun, beautiful build up, and that is the reason why it has secured a spot as number six on my top 10 list. Ooh, we are halfway through top 10 and moving on to number five. Now for this one, this one I think is one of the biggest surprises for me personally. I didn't think it was going to be a game that I liked at all. This one is Red Rising. Now I didn't read any of the books on Red Rising. I felt like I would appreciate the game even more if I did, but this is essentially a card game. So in Red Rising, this is a futuristic dystopian society divided into a bunch of casts. And ultimately you're playing with one out of six houses that is trying to raise to power by also gaining followers as well. As much as I love board games, I completely suck at them. Seriously, like I lose like all the time, which is fine. No, but seriously, I love playing them, but I'm usually not very good at them. For some reason, with Red Rising, everything just clicks for me. And I've never lost a game to this day playing Red Rising. For some reason, this game clicks. And what I love most about it, I would say two main things. One are the combos that you make and that you are building up towards the end of the game. You have a set of cards and you have multiple paths to victory. Not only are they dictated by the cards that you have, but also by the tracks that you decide to follow along the board. What's really, really cool about it is I've actually won in Red Rising and I've made strategies 
approaching different paths, whether it's for the, the fleet track or the science track or going on going towards the Mars track, I've won with every single one of those. And what's really cool about it is the second major thing that I would say that I really love about this game is the adaptability. Despite the cards that you start with, despite the tracks that you go for, if you're able to play your cards right and you're able to understand the links that you should prioritize and the links that you shouldn't prioritize and which ones you should get rid of, which ones you should keep, even hybridizing between two tracks and prioritizing those two instead of just one, it just, it just makes for a very, very interesting dynamic gameplay. I always want to play this game, but for whatever reason, now no one wants to play this one anymore. If you haven't tried Red Rising, you know, check out my full review on it as well, like my thoughts. I feel like are a little bit different now, but still, I just, I still hands down love the game. I just love it that much more than what was in my review like sometime way ago, long time ago, last year. We're creators, our thoughts change, they adapt, just like you do in Red Rising. Now for the last four games on this list, I will tell you now that you probably won't be surprised if you have been following my channel for quite some time. Number four, Marvel United. <laughs> Marvel United, you have your favorite heroes, you have your favorite villains. Practically every single character in the Marvel Universe is represented in this game. Only play this game solo, it does have a cooperative mode and I'm sure this is like one of the very, very rare games I would love to play cooperatively. But in this game, it is essentially, if you distill it down, it is a card game. You have multiple decks of cards depending on which character that you play with. Now there are two main attributes of the cards. Yes, they have your own unique powers and abilities, but it also prioritizes the types of attributes depending on the hero that you play with. So for example, for Hulk, you have way more attack icons. And for Falcon, you have way more mobility icons. That makes it super cool and very tailored towards the hero that you're playing with. Since I play Marvel United solo, and also play the World of Warcraft, Wrath of the Lich King, Pandemic System solo as well, I feel like it's a fair comparison between the two because for this one, I would choose this one over the uh, Lich King because the synchronicity in team play here is way more interesting, I think, than for Lich King. I mean, you have, what, five to seven heroes in the other game versus look how many heroes are provided here, right? So you have way more content available for Marvel United. The interactions between different heroes are really cool. Some heroes actually will fare better than others when you're facing against like Hela or Ultron, what have you. Aside from the obvious choices between all your heroes being available and all your villains being available, what I really love about this game are how interesting the villains are presented and how you can really have an infinite amount of combinations available in order to face each villain. And it's just so, so cool. I cannot wait for the next Marvel United, the X-Men 2, because that one introduces a whole other world of mechanics as well. But yeah, Marvel United, easily secured a spot on my top 10 list. Love playing this game, and I just can't wait to dive into every single box. Okay, so if Marvel United was number four, then you can probably guess what is number three. This one is Marvel Champions. Now, I would almost argue to say that this is the more mature version of a Marvel-themed board game. Now, I say that because there is a ton more complexity in this game, and I feel like overall, the mechanics are way more interesting, and there are no uh, fun minis, which is okay, because the story, the character representation is very strong in this card game. I feel like Marvel Champions is the one game I play solo at least two to three times a week because I just love it that much. Now, there are two main reasons why I rank this one higher than Marvel United, and one of them, for Marvel United, in order to increase the difficulty, you're going to just remove cards from the game. With Marvel Champions, it's not like that because villains actually have a completely different form that you have to take on when fighting them. The second reason is that the deck customization just wins it over for me. I have always been a huge fan of Yu-Gi-Oh! I never really played Pokemon cards, but I obviously loved Pokemon cards. Yu-Gi-Oh was like, I was so into Yu-Gi-Oh, so having that background and loving a <laughs> trading card game that I was super into for many, many years, I think it's really fulfilling. Being able to relive that experience through a different IP and through a completely different battle mechanic is just amazing and it's so fun. Trust me, if you like Marvel, yes, you will love Marvel United, but I think you will love Marvel Champions even more. And the cool thing is for Marvel Champions, it's a living card game. So they're constantly coming out with new content, new heroes, new villains, brand new expansions. So that is a major plus for me as well. Okay, here we are, the final two on today's list. Number two is Aquatica. It is not an understatement to say that this game is always on like my pile of board games that I bring to board game events when we have them. If I'm deciding between all the games on my shelf, this is always going to be in the pile because I just, 
I've never been bored playing Aquatica again and again and again. I feel like I played Aquatica the most out of any game in 2021. You check out my full review here if you want to know more about the game, but ultimately you're a sea lord, you're playing with different cards, there are a ton of card combos, very, very unique sliding mechanisms. It's an incredibly unique, fun, diversifying, beautiful board game. I played this game because I covered it for the Dice Tower and there are just so many, so many, I can go on and on about the reasons why I love this game and why it's number two on my list. Let me give you a few highlights. When you see other players play this game and it clicks for them and you see how they start to combo off different cards, it's just so satisfying and rewarding to see. It's very, very easy to teach. There is so much more complexity underneath the surface. It plays wonderfully from two to five players. I wouldn't really recommend it solo because it's, uh, I feel like the solo mode here is very, very boring. Uh, you're just pretty much trying to score the highest amount of points possible and it kind of gets redundant really, really fast, but at two players and higher, it is amazing. If you're looking for a unique game, if you're looking for a game that is easy to teach, that's easy to bring to every board game group, trust me, Aquatica is one that you are probably looking for. Luna. Lastly, it's a water theme. And you all know how I feel about the water theme with the 10 photos behind me all being water oriented as well. Okay, here we are at the number one most favorite game I've ever played in 2021. Here we go. I feel like this game came out so long ago because of how many times we've played this game and how many times I've covered it. Dwellings of Eldervale, come on. You're going to see this on many, many more board game lists. I'm sorry, I'm gonna try not to put it on there, but to be frank with you, it deserves to be on practically every list that I ever make. <laughs> I love this game so much. I feel like I did the cinematic on this like years ago, but actually it was just last year. It was actually the very first video that I came out with in 2021. But ever since then, my goodness, it has never stopped being played across this one versus Aquatica has been played across all player accounts and it is amazing. Dwellings of Eldervale is essentially a worker placement game. All you're doing is placing a worker on your turn or calling them back. But it is so much more involved than that. There are a ton of different paths to victory, a ton of different ways to score victory points. Battle is amazing. You're rolling dice, but there's also strategy involved. You can add different tokens in order for you to augment your battle mechanisms. Your factions give you unique player powers across combat, across recovery, across um, gaining different resources. There's a front side and a back side to factions. The meeples are beautiful. The design, the production quality, the gameplay, everything about it. I have zero, zero complaints about this game, no joke. The only complaint I would probably have is why aren't there more copies available because I would love to buy this and gift this to all my friends because this is the one game that every single person I've introduced to has genuinely loved and have asked to play again and again and again. Family, friends, you name them. They all love this game. I don't know a single person that doesn't like this game. One of the biggest selling points for me and the reason why I think this game is so approachable for everybody is that when you're teaching it, yeah, there are a ton of layers. Yeah, there's a big, huge, giant rule book to it, but you ultimately only do two actions on your turn. Like I said earlier, you place a worker or you call them back. And if you kind of start out with that when you're teaching this game, it just makes learning that much easier. Like I said, it plays beautifully across solo, two, three, four, five players. I wish it went up to six, seven players because that would be Fantastic. Yes, the gameplay would be long, but but I'm okay with it. My group would be okay with it too. Be prepared though, especially if you're playing with people that take a little bit longer in their turns, that it is a very, very lengthy game. But trust me, hands down, it's so worth it. I think it's worth every single penny. It's I love this game so much. What's also really cool about it, what I think makes it super unique compared to all the other games I presented today on this list, is that it really incorporates the, the vibes, for lack of a better term, of a party game with the complexity, the depth that we crave as board gamers. And also when you distill it down, the actions are simple, but they have so much complexity, so much depth to it. And being able to choose asymmetric factions, like there's everything that you want in a board game is in this game, or at least everything that I want in a board game is presented in this game. The unique factions, the crazy epic monsters, the battle mechanics, the fun memories, we've recorded so many different Snapchats, uh, Instagram stories, you name it. It's just, it's been so fun. Honestly, I cannot rave about this game enough. I can make 10 more videos about it. Let's go on for another 10 minutes. If you haven't tried it, you need to try it. Hands down, you need to try Dwellings of Eldervale. With that, I hope you all enjoyed this top 10 board game list. Let me know down in the comments below if you enjoyed this video, whether or not you would rank different games on this list, what your top 10 games are. And with that, thank you so much for being here. Again, subscribe if you aren't already. And I'll see you all in the next video.